presented today. Um, so um, we're going to start with um, Mr. Carroll, um, Chair of the State Board of Education. I understand Mr. Peltz, you also want to testify? I would just testify. Okay, why don't you both come up at the same time? Thank you. And just, you know, introduce yourself for the record. Yes. My name is John Carroll. I'm Peter Peltz. Um, we're both members of the State Board of Education. Thank you for having us here. Um, I'm the chair of the board, uh, sort of recently thrust into that situation for various reasons, and um, I'm the person who is behind the <coughs> seven-page answer to your questions. <laughs> I, I hope they weren't too long, but nope. Nope. Uh, the answers to your questions are, are um, the proper answers are somewhat nuanced. Uh, you know, the, the, the general texture of your inquiry is, is the board's doing useful things and is it still necessary? And I think my answer to that question is sort of, but it ought to be doing a lot more. Um, that is to say, much of the way the board has been conducting its affairs in the last many years is, is a sort of an adjunct of the Agency of Education. Um, as you know, Act 98 of 2012 turned things upside down. And until that time, the board had been effectively the board of directors of the, of the Department of Education. It hired and fired the CEO of the department. And Act 98, of course, uh, turned that around and gave that uh, authority to the governor. Um, and it, it, it would seem to me as a comparative newcomer on the board that the board never, and for that matter the agency, never fully got that memo. Uh, and that many of the things that the board still does date from an earlier time. Uh, so, for example, much of what the board does is overseeing the activities of the agency of education sometimes sort of putting its stamp of approval on there. But very often these things are specified in statute. They're vestigial from an earlier time. Um, and, and frankly, uh, the board spends the majority of its time on this kind of administrative oversight to which, frankly, I don't think it lends a great deal of value. Um, we are a group of lay people. Um, we're very much, in some senses, like the legislature itself. We are independent citizens. Uh, we are different than the legislature in the sense that we are not partisan. We don't have political affiliations. Um, we are not, I want to make very clear, we are not a group of advocates. You know, many of the boards that you deal with are a collection of advocates from this point of view and that point of view, what you might call the stakeholders in any particular issue. We have no stakeholders. We are individual citizens. Uh, in fact, I, I noticed, looking at the history of Act 98, there was a provision in the early bill of Act 98 to uh, assign to the board certain representatives of certain interest groups, like the Principals Association or the VSBA. And that was dropped out, and I think that that was very <coughs> wise and attentive to the board's kind of unique function. It's a very diverse group. Um, a few former educators, a lot of people from other backgrounds, uh, legi former legislators and business people like my colleague, Mr. Peltz. Um, and uh, the age is quite remarkable. The youngest member of the board is 16, bless her heart, and a very talented and, and terrific young woman. And the oldest member of the board is 60 years older. And I don't know who that might be. Uh, and, and, and we have everything in between. And um, we bring a, a diverse set of perspectives to our work. But we don't bring a lot of technical expertise. So in that sense, this seems to us a uh, little point in, in scrutinizing in detail what the agency is doing. They are more expert than we. <coughs> Uh, much of this is by habit and custom. Much of it is actually still enshrined in statute. And so we, we are working, um, in fact, I have a phone conference tomorrow with legislative council member associated with the uh, Senate Committee on Education to begin formulating kind of what the chair calls a placeholder piece of legislation that would get started on documenting what these vestigial pieces of statute are and presumably the, uh, both 
the House and Senate committee chairs have indicated great interest in, in our goal of reinventing the board. And frankly, that is our goal to reinvent the board. Um, I, I want to, um, I know that the, the board has its critics. Um, just a historical note that might be amusing at the very least. You know, the State Board of Education has existed for well over 100 years. It had its early formative shape in Civil War times. Uh, and it has existed and been uh, terminated probably three or four times over the course of that 120 years. It's interesting to notice sort of when does the State Board get uh, uh, executed, uh, exterminated. And it's usually at a time when there's a, a burst historically of uh, localism, local control becomes a fervent issue. It's always an issue in Vermont, as you know, but there are, it has these sort of peaks and valleys. And of course, Act 46 kind of really nudged that bear. And um, uh, um, you all knew that when you adopted Act 46, and you all knew that when you handed to the state board the dirty work to actually implement it. Um, and sure enough, um, we offended many communities, and uh, some of us, I think, feel, felt a great deal, many of us, wh whether we voted for or against the state plan, uh, felt a lot of um, regret about how we were changing the landscape for these communities. But we felt that we were directed by you to do so. Of course, as a consequence, we've taken a fair amount of, of uh, heat for that. Um, so historically, the board has gone in and out of business, usually going out of business at a time quite like this, when there is this uh, stirred up fervor. Uh, it, our, our goal, I, I think I would characterize what the board does now is most of its time is on this administrative stuff. But another important part of the, what the board does is your work. It, the, the General Assembly has I would say you, the work we do for the General Assembly or at the direction of the General Assembly would take over <coughs> the years maybe 40% of our time. For example, Act 46, we were in that up to our eyeballs for eight solid months. I mean, there was nothing else going on on the board except Act 46 hearings. Um, uh, similarly, um, uh, when it came to the small schools grants, uh, the legislature in its wisdom decided that the metrics for awarding small school grants should be changed. It's a very controversial matter. And um, guess what? Uh, the state yes. board was assigned the duty to do change I, I just want to make a point. Um, you, a couple of times you referred to the committee as you or oh, you. Pardon me. Um, first of all, they're not the legislature, they're the members, and there are two members appointed by the governor. So. Thank you. For, we have a different for that clarification. A different Thank I, you. I didn't mean to tar you with such a question. <laughs> 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 it was an honor, wasn't it? <laughs> Accolades. <laughs> okay. More than like Moving on. The point is that the governor and a former legislator. Right. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, that's your fault. So, in, in the General <laughs> Assembly and, and, uh, 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 has then chosen to assign to the state board some pretty delicate issues. Act 46, small school grants, which again annoyed some people. Um, but you knew that when you gave it to us to do. And then uh, most recently, Act 70, 173, which we are right now starting to get involved in, up to our eyeballs in, where in the, the, by statute, the General Assembly directed that it would be the state board, not the agency of education, that would adopt <laughs> rules for the reform of special education. And of course, the the uh, hard work of drafting the rules comes from the Agency of Education. But in fact, there are other entities, a, a group created by the legislation called the Census-Based Funding Advisory Committee, uh, which is, is an assemblage of special inter or interest groups, stakeholders. And they have been kind of at loggerheads with the agency over the rules that the agency has proposed. And uh, I think... Uh, Outside observers might note that the fact that the state board ultimately has the final say on these rules has been um, has contributed to maybe a convergence of views on the among the competing <coughs> parties. Rob has a question. I just wanted to take a quick step back while yes. you were going through the, the history of the state board. And um, has there ever been a point in time where you find yourself like you are now, 
where you have a secretary of education as opposed to what were they a commissioner or whatever before I mean has has that relationship ebbed and flowed as well over time or are we in kind of a unique area now my sense is that this is a comparatively unique time because for the first time the in the better part of a hundred years uh, I mean there have been some it's a it's a long and variegated history but the general theme has been that the board has served as the board of directors of whatever was the state agency of education and and you know boards of directors hire and fire and they're, they're the um, the executive director does what they say those days are gone and and uh, the secretary quite uh, correctly and occasionally has to point that out to the board um, and, and moreover there's not much point in critiquing the work of the agency if we have no authority to direct that they make it better uh, so very frequently things will come to us and we say gee this could be a lot better but okay we'll sign off and sometimes we'll say that and the agency will voluntarily go back and improve it I mean there's a collaborative respectful relationship between the two but Ultimately, we need to move past the time of, for the last hundred years where we were calling the shots. We are not calling the shots. I, I just want to also just clarify that education in Vermont is, is perhaps after healthcare, the single largest economic activity of the state. On any given day, any given school day, there are 90,000 Vermonters in our schools. Think about that. That's the entire population of five counties are not at home, not in their county, they're in schools. Think of the power of that. It's, it's sort of like health care. It's a huge driver of the economy. In addition to the 75,000 students, there are about 15,000 adults, teachers, administrators, school bus drivers, food preparation folks, all kinds of folks associated with making schools work. Uh, there's 100,000 parents, roughly, who uh, are not in the schools, but they're waiting at the schoolhouse door at the end of the day and they want to know what happened and they, they, most of them really care a whole lot about what happens in schools. So education in Vermont, pre K through 12, involves probably at least a quarter of all Vermonters. Um, and, and it's expensive. As you know, it's a third of state spending. It's a huge enterprise. It's also an important economic driver. It creates about 15,000 jobs, uh, some of which are very well paying. Um, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a big gorilla in the midst. <coughs> uh, 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 excuse me, S yes. Senator, would you like to interrupt? First of all, my apologies. I guess I didn't get the memos, and I've been up at National Life oh. along with Kim Brigland oh. looking for parking space. Oh. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so. I apologize for missing the first part of your presentation, but just from what I've heard, I, I guess my question is, why, why do we feel that we need to have a, a board of education right. Right. to direct the future of education as opposed to the um, agency <coughs> of education when we, we have agency of natural resources we don't have um, a board of natural resources. And the fact that all the members are appointed by governors, not the same governor, but appointed by governors, as opposed to coming from local school boards. Or So I, I guess that's, that's my bottom line question is what, and the legislature did assign all of these things to the board because it was there. If the board hadn't been there, those things would have been assigned to the agency. Is that the way I see it? I mean, I'm not sure because I'm not in the education education committee. But so. if I may, I, I'd like to answer. I, I do my best. Uh, again, Peter Peltz. I was on the House Education Ca Committee for eight years, and I was on the committee when Act 98 passed. It was not. Uh, it was controversial. There was, um, um, but I can tell you why I voted for it. Um, I, re I really think, well, first of all, our Constitution, the state has a, a vital role in providing education to the youth and preparing them for their adult lives. They called it virtue in the, in the Constitution, but they were, were they really looking at it that it was in the best interest of the students and getting them ready for, their, again, their adult lives. That hasn't changed. Um, and 
when when we did this, I thought that the role of the board should be a, 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 a gatekeeper, a buffer between the the administration and the legislature and the district at uh, district levels. I thought that was, it's a very important role to play, just to make sure that that they that there is a position for the board to act in the best interests of, of, of the of the districts. I asked to be appointed onto the uh, 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 to the uh, board when I resigned from office in, in 14, and um, and I still very I feel very strongly about that. Um, and just to sort of demonstrate, I mean, it. I think the governor has appointed some really good members. We coalesced. It's nonpartisan. 46 was a hard hard nut to crack and to work together. We did it collaboratively, and I think we did it well. Um, and I, and I think that stands, say it stands uh, well for our position in regards to why we should be there and, and why we should continue. Um, I, I uh, really feel very strongly that, um, uh, not to disparage, but you know, just the bureaucracy of, of, govern, of, of educating our kids is, 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 is very significant and, and um, I, I really think the role the, the state board has a role in in, in sort of um, being being that that buffer um, and 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 to demonstrate this we have decided at, at our last meeting that we will no longer meet during the regular hours of the of the day we're going to meet late in the day and then go to regional meet I'll go throughout the state to have meetings and have our regular meeting at three o'clock and then at five o'clock we will open it up to the public to, to hear from the public on, on, on what their thoughts are uh, and, and what we, uh, how we can, can best represent their, their interests. So I, I hope we, we continue in that vein and really um, um, clearly define that. They, they, you know, the, this, the, the agency owns us. I mean, we have no staff, we have no budget to provide a staff. So we're really, we're really sort of, you know, at, at, a, at a, a transitional point in terms of trying to, trying to uh, Get, a, get us focused and be very efficient in what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Rob, do you have a question? Um, I do, and maybe it'll get clarified a little closer, but your, your comment about the state ed being a, a large bureaucracy. Well, I'm not, actually, I'm just, yeah. Uh, well, I happen to yeah. you know, agree with that somewhat. Yeah. Um, my question would be is, is uh, the current structure with you folks being kind of a separate entity, uh, does it add to that bureaucracy, at least from the user end of things as opposed to from your end? Let, let me just clarify. It, when it's working properly, the State Board has no power. We have no power to direct. We no, have no power to demand testimony or anything. The State Board, in its, in its best form, uh, mm -hmm. inquires, that is, asks <coughs> tough questions, um, uh, and, and integrates conflicting information, which is all around the state, and informs the General Assembly and the Governor about issues that perhaps, and or in, informs the agency, or informs superintendents, uh, whoever is closest to implementing solutions. Um, I, if I may, I'd like to return to Senator White's question. Why not, why have a board when, when the natural resources people don't? Education is not constructed in any way like any other government enterprise in Vermont. Nothing like it. Uh, education in Vermont has at least five major constituencies and power centers. So when you, for example, use the term that the agency directs education in Vermont, frankly, it influences it, but education in Vermont is so democratized and so locally based and so heterogeneous that frankly nobody directs it, not even the General Assembly or the Governor, and certainly not the agency or the board. Yes, the agency can adopt rules and regulations which require certain behaviors, but frankly what happens in the classroom is far <coughs> beyond the influence and control of, of anybody uh, except perhaps the principal and the teacher in, involved. It's an extremely decentralized democratic institution. There's the federal government, there's the state, the state agency of education, there are regional superintendencies, there are uh, multi-town school districts, single-town school districts, there are schools, hundreds and hundreds of them, there are classrooms, thousands of them, and, 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 and oh, and by the way, 100,000 uh, parents who also think they know something about education. All of these are players in, in this process of education which 
is not directed from the top at all. It's nothing like a corporate organizational structure. It's uh, heterogeneous. And so the question gets to be, who sees the whole thing? Who has no stake in any of it and sees the whole thing? And that, I think, is the unique role of the board. We're not players. We don't have power. We shouldn't have power to, to direct or force. We're not a legislative entity. There were times when the board got over its skis, as they say, and did do that, and should, it, at least in this leadership, that will never happen again. Our role is to, is to um, n number one, we need to be available to the legislature to do what it has asked us to do, things like one, Act 173, like Act 46. If you don't have the state board, you won't have anybody in the field with a broad <coughs> non-political base to implement some of your directives. Um, and, and moreover, uh, without a state board, you basically will have no entity in the state that has a nonpartisan, um, non, uh, a nonpartisan independent overview of education, and has has the license to attempt to bring about consensus and shape the future of education. Can I ask a couple of yeah. quick questions, John, and, and here? And these are very, because of time constraints, I'd ask you to consider just very briefly. Uh, I'm sure you understand that uh, we sunset organizations, the administ uh, an administrative uh, uh, branch comes to us or like a, an agency and says, here are the, ag here are the organizations you want us to to review, we think these three should no longer exist and should be sunsetted. So my first question to you folks very briefly, is it your expectation the State Board of Education does not want us to sunset them? Yes. Do not. Do not. The State Board does not. You don't? Okay, that's first. Second of all, is it your intention to work, continue to work with the Agency of Education and the administration <coughs> to clarify whatever that new relationship is with uh, your new role and your relationship with the Agency of Education. Of course, but okay. also the legislature. And that's been evolving since 98 was was enacted. Okay, all right. Uh, the third one is you just answered, uh, oh, well, let me phrase the other question first. You do realize what a precarious position the State Board of Education is in at the moment. Perhaps you could help us understand what makes right. it so precarious. So I'll give you the example. I come from Stowe now. I'm not involved in any of the local school boards in Stowe, and I'm not involved in any of the, I don't have any decision-making authority with Stowe. Um, you can't go down and get a cup of coffee without hearing about the State Board of Education, et cetera. Um, I realized that the uh, sort of base closing duties were given to you folks, and you had to carry them out. Nobody likes that kind of function, but you are in a somewhat precarious position. Yes. So that's all on that, that acknowledged. And then I do want you to ask or answer if you're willing to work with the committees of jurisdiction in the legislature after you've sorted that out to explain yourself better with all the stakeholders involved, uh, you know, and n not so much as a, a small group like the six members here in this commission. It's my expectation that you'll do that. You'll House and Senate committees of jurisdiction. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've already I met um, last week with both the chairs um, of the two uh, committees. I should think government operations also has an interest in in yeah, this, right. um, and it's uh, our hope to introduce legislation, or that the, the chair, the committees will introduce legislation to restructure the relationship between the agency and the board. Um, it probably move toward independence of one another. I think we're a pain in their butt sometimes, and frankly, that's what statute requires us to do, and we have no desire to do that. It's not a very good use of our time. So all those legislative changes will have to be around here a lot to explain why they're worth doing. Um, and our hope is that your committee will say, this board needs to change, they want to change, and uh, let's give them some headroom to work that out with the General Assembly. Okay, and then one last question I have. <coughs> Would you be willing at some point or some uh, to return to this uh, commission, you know, and say, well, here are the changes that we've made, here's how we think we're making progress, here's the groups that we've, you know, brought into the process, here's what we've been doing. I'm sorry, can you do it? Yeah, I, and I would hope that the dialogue and the exchanges between the legislature and, and, and the board would be a healthy, and it, you know, the, the board has not always been 
in favor, you know, had, had strong standing with the legislature. I would hope that we could really develop a relationship that would work both ways, you know, that we could, be, which it could be, curiously has been done by uh, 46 and 173 and, and, and other things that, that have been, you know, we've been in, in, empowered to deal with. That didn't happen in the past, and I and if that's where we're continuing to do, I hope that relationship and the exchange it, it improves. In other words, that we really do develop a, relation, a working relationship. Okay. Yeah, I might just observe that uh, my colleague here is a uh, card-carrying Democrat, and I'm a card-carrying Republican, and he's been on the board much longer than I, and he's the one who wanted to come here and be with me to advocate with you. So. We, we and that also may if I say th there is I have never seen any partisanship on at this board. Okay. It's a good healthy exchange, good good healthy exchange, informed exchange. <coughs> but we have a lot of work to do. I, I concur, and we hope you will uh, encourage us to move forward with that work. And if we fail at that, then <coughs> good lord. Frankly, I don't want to be on a board that's doing what we've been doing. It's just not a good use of anybody's time. It's a six-year appointment. That's it. That's six years in a long time. That's all that was really on my question. Mm -hmm. So you. just to follow up on Matt's questions, um, and, and some of the statements you made about not having a power, um, you know, the legislature gave you power under Act 46 mm -hmm. and under oh, Act yes. 173. Thank you. Um, to do certain things. Right. And I'm confused as to where you as the board wants to be. Do you want to be in a sort of oversight role where you're looking at what the Agency of Education does and what's good for Vermont schools, or do you want to be actively participating in policy making through what you've done with Act 46 and with Act 173? Well, I think the board is, is uh, always available to do the General Assembly's bidding, uh, and so in, that, in the case of that, it was of Act 76, uh, 177, we're certainly shaping uh, uh, rules, but the general policy is already cast in stone by the legislation as it should be. We don't want to, I just don't want us ever to get close to creating law. Um, and I want we can. to, I want to have very clear boundaries so that, that the general, that the, the board is working at the direction and behest of the General Assembly. Beside that work though, I would like the board to become kind of a think tank about education in Vermont and gathering information, not, by the way, just looking over the shoulder of the agency. Because the vast majority of what really happens in education isn't happening at the agency. It's happening in the schools and in the districts. And, and that's where we need to spend more time, is where it's on the ground, where it's happening. And, and, and be, uh, number one, talking about accountability, and number two, talking about visioning a, a better system than we have. Can I briefly, we, we cannot make policy, but we can help you enact it and, and, and make it work. But I guess following up on that, it's, I'm concerned. I mean, okay, so we passed education legislation. Uh, you know, typically the agency of education would be responsible for implementing that, but at least in these two instances, Act 46 and Act 173, um, the legislature, for whatever reason, chose to have the State Board of Education do that. And, and I guess I, I'm just... Should we be doing that? Because there is some confusion about who is taking legislation and you know creating the regulations and, and you know driving that down to the, the school boards right. and the schools. Can right. I just observe that the, a lot of the law did specify what the agencies did in regards to this. They they set the table, and then they say, okay, it's up to you to make the decisions. But they they set they set the table. It, it, that, that's exactly right, correct. It was in that case a collaboration where the actual rules or state plan was drafted by the agency, handed to the board to then sign off on, and we made some, some changes, yeah, still changes. being a good example. Um, they, but but in, in, in general, the, the, the less rulemaking and directing the board does is probably better because we don't have the expertise that educators do. Or the resources. Yes, and definitely not the resources. There are, though, exceptional cases where you feel, that is, the legislature feels, that we want an independent um, entity of citizens, not not civil servants, making the final decision about this. And that's <coughs> precisely what, was the, what you did in Act 173. And, and we are available and reasonably capable of doing that work. 
Rob, did you have a question? Well, I, I, I did. Just, I'm just I'm curious as to how you get the feedback from the local levels. Mm -hmm. um, does it come directly? Do you end up having to get it indirectly through the Department of Ed as far as, you know, what got me thinking about this is I, it was just really quick this morning, but I'm listening to the proficiency-based learning. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like that there's a little confusion and some concern about that. Uh, sounds like you folks went out and made some decisions that were within your purview, but yet, and again, I just heard this quickly, but it seems like that the Secretary of Education's out there trying to explain it. Mm -hmm. is, is that indicative of how this is working currently? The that, relationship. I, I was when I was on the committee or on the committee when that that bill passed, and it, it gave the authority to the local district to to do. I mean, and so there wasn't one 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 formula that had to be applied universally. It was up to the up to the local districts to to apply it. So, and I think that's that's been the big issue, and that really didn't have anything to do with us. And we did, we talked about it, but there was really no role in that we had to be able to to. Uh, um, so we are just advisory, and, and, and uh, but we can't we we have play no role in that. This, this is sort of an illustration of the kind of democratic, heterogeneous way that education unfolds in this state. There was no uh, template given by anybody, the legislature or the agency, about how proficiency-based learning should be done. It was left to every school to figure it out. That's the way Vermonters seem to want to do. A lot of things is at the local level, local control, um, uh, highly heterogeneous, and so you get very different results. And you have some schools that have really done quite an amazing job at implementing uh, PBL, and some that have really botched it. And 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 that's what happens when you leave it to folks to figure it out. And and that was, I think, quite clearly stipulated in the statute that. Uh, you would do this, but how to do it was left to each district to figure out. Just like curriculum. Curriculum in every school district in superintendency is a local matter. State board has no control over curriculum. We set standards, but we don't set curriculum. It, so I think part of what we see, and it's a concern of the board, is that with any new initiative, you get, you get in some schools, you'll get terrific implementation, and it really benefits the children right away, and you can see it, and it was a smart law. And then in other districts, it's very slow to roll out and maybe never does. And, and those children um, are at a disadvantage as a result. So part of the challenge that we face in our state is this wide variation between um, sort of strong districts, well-resourced districts, and districts with, with different resources and, frankly, different uh, aspirations for their children. It's, it's like we're dealing with two different nations sometimes, and that's how it felt during, during Act 46. Jeanette? No, I, I am not going to ask my question, but that, that is true with lots of things. It isn't just education. If we look at our justice system, we have 14 different justice systems in Vermont because we have 14 separately elected um, state's attorneys, and we have 14 different elected sheriffs. So I just came yeah, from yeah. Waterbury with a meeting with Mike Sherling, and I mean, there are issues there too, so it isn't just yeah. education. Yeah, it's it's Vermont. <laughs> yeah, we do and, things here. And it, it does seem to me that the legislature passes. I mean, I'm surprised that I wasn't involved in Act 46, but I mean, I voted for it, but I misunderstood it. <laughs> I have to admit. And um, the the legislature passes legislation, and then the executive branch implements it and administers it, but here we have an, a non-elected, non, um, uh, right. what's the word, um, you might say accountable, accountable right. to, to anybody, group, implementing yep. the legislation. And yep. I'm not sure that that's, anyway. Well, that's for you all to decide. Right. It really is. And uh, I, hope you, I hope you think about what, what would it be like without the board. I mean, that's, that's, I think we have, I, I firmly believe we play a vital role, otherwise, I don't think we have the quality of the people that are on it, quite honestly. Well, no matter what we do here, sure. the, any recommendation that we make clearly goes to the two education committees, mm -hmm. and they're the ones that, so we don't have any final say. In, right, but you have influence on, and we're uh, <coughs> right. hoping to 
uh, encourage you to right. give us room to improve. Um, and thank you for offering that time. <coughs> Thank you. Well, I think we need to wrap up now. Yes, of course. So yes. Thank you very much for testifying, Mr. Carroll and Mr. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you all. Thank, thank, you. thank you again. We're glad it worked out time. Thank, thank you. you. Glad you could be here for most of it. For most of it. Let's see if the gang is out there. On Friday. Oh, on Friday. Let me just give a little background here of what happened and why why you're all here. It's Laura's fault. So I we are tasked with looking at boards and commissions and which should exist and which shouldn't exist and which might which ones might be combined to be more effective and because we know that a lot of boards and commissions kind of get created and then they outlive their usefulness and or something else pops up. So I was having this conversation with um, Laura because this is an area where I know nothing. And I, I really, it is not my, my area. So I was having this conversation with Laura and um, she said, well, you can't, how can you decide what kind of governance you need if you don't know what it is, not big IT, but little IT, it. And she said the oversight committee has been working, and I'm not sure if they've been working with you over the summer, but you are involved in this, that you've been working on looking at what it is we need to know about. Is that fair? What, what it is we need to know before we can start asking the questions about how should we govern? And you're not looking at governance necessarily, but you're looking at what it is we need to know about this whole area. So we decided that it would make sense to just have a roundtable discussion about where you guys are and what it is we need to be thinking about before we start thinking about governance. Does that make sense at all? Yeah. Um, <coughs> so may I yeah, advance I, that? Yes. yes. May I do that now? Yes, okay. it, you may. <laughs> so um, specifically, the IT, the Joint IT Oversight Committee has been looking at cybersecurity mm -hmm. um, and also IT, some of the larger IT projects. Um, and I think that what I really wanted to share with you when you and I met was um, that the cybersecurity issue is very serious mm -hmm. and that the legislature does not have a handle on it and that we really needed to focus energy on getting a handle on it, which is going to be difficult, and that I hoped we would focus our efforts on that in this session, as opposed to creating a new oversight structure for governance structure. <clears throat> and then you said, well, why don't you come and talk to us? And that's why you're here. Now, I should say that we started our effort, though, by trying to get a handle on the totality of IT in Vermont, starting by looking at, in effect, every agency of, of state government, every department of state government, every independent officer, the legislature, the judiciary, of just creating a map that says, is there, what is the IT structure? Is there one there? Who's responsible for it? What mm -hmm. is the relationship between it and, and uh, the Agency of Digital Services? Uh, what's the role of the Chief Information <laughs> Officer, uh, if any, with respect to these? And we found stuff all over the map. And to me, it, it's clear that, well, of course, I, I asked the question, why do we need a government structure since everything we have is working so well right now? And it's not. <laughs> That's a cynical view. Uh, there are, are lots of things that appear to be uncoordinated. Uh, the, the overlay of this, I think, is to also you know, be thinking about IT in a broader sense, because the whole issue of information technology and telecommunications, for example, are increasingly intersecting. We used to deal with them separately. Mm -hmm. We used to say that telecommunications is the responsibility of the Department of Public Service uh, because it is the that's the old regulated telephone company model. But now, uh, the where IT stops 
and telecommunications begin is a, is a line that nobody really knows, and it's increasingly intersected, and, and certainly when you look at the Verizons and, and the AT&T of the world, they're, 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 their feet are clearly in both camps, uh, in terms of both the internet and also the transmission of, of telephone signals that used to be solely the, the regulated telephone company's role. So that, that to me is one of the bigger issues that we really need to think about. Uh, what's compounding all of this though and making it more complicated is the role of the federal government versus the states. Uh, in the old model of telecommunications, we have oversight through the Public Service Department and the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, we've got control of these telephone companies. But as the telephone companies move into the internet, and as the internet moves into transmitting telephone signals, many of us use Comcast or whatever uh, as, our, as our landline now, and indeed many Vermonters don't use a landline at all. Their, their telephones are, are solely in the net. And all of that has, is the almost exclusive, there's some exceptions, responsibility uh, of the federal government. It preempts many of the things that we can do. People knock on our door and say, you got to prevent 5G because it's going to kill us and end the world. And <clears throat> our answer is, we can't do anything about it. We can, do not have even the ability to control what are potential health hazards, if there were any, mm -hmm. uh, because that is the exclusive province of the federal government. So that compounds anything mm -hmm. that we may want to do vis-a-vis -vis governance. So that, that to me, is, is, is the issue, uh, and I think Laura and I have discussed briefly that maybe this is a, a year in which we really need to study what is the, the, the model that we have regarding uh, 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 this whole governance structure of, of IT uh, as opposed to moving precipitously. I mean, there are all kinds of ways that we can move precipitously and so on. Uh, the second thing, though, in my mind, though, that we, we may need to do, and this is something we may need to do this year, we need to talk about it further, is strengthen the role and clarify the role of the state's chief information officer. Because one of the things in terms of the matrix we did is to clear, is to, is, is at least to establish the fact that we're all over the board and the notion of some dotted line responsibility uh, to the chief information officer for information technology throughout the state may be a role. And don't <coughs> kill everything until we study it about how things are organized now, but look at the role of the chief information officer as, a, in effect, a dotted line responsibility to stay on top of IT throughout state government. That may be something, a limited step, that may make sense at, at this point. And I know there, there, there are differing views of that, but uh, so that, that's kind of the long-winded summary of, of, of just what I see in the landscape. Yeah, I know that this came up last year. So gov Senate GovOps is in the room right here, and institutions is here, and finance is here. We're right there all yeah. and whenever anything would come up in finance and institute it seemed that it was going like this well we do that but we don't do that they do that we do that but they do that and and so from a governance standpoint we started saying well who is responsible and who who does run the shop and we, we couldn't figure out. You guys might have been smarter than us, but we couldn't <laughs> figure it out. And so that's... Yeah, and quite and the Senate is you know we don't have a committee like the House does that deals with with. with I've with, addressed that with the pro tem and yeah. said that we we need to sign it someplace. We need to yeah put it, it, needs put to it in some place. But realistically, it's, the way we're structured, there are things that each of these entities does that are sufficiently unique that uh, even if we had a, 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 you know, a separate committee, and I, I'm not necessarily advocating that, uh, the other committees, the things that are in their jurisdiction are still going to be involved. They, they are, but it, we do need to have a central, I think, um, that's going to be the main committee. And then as things, mm -hmm. um, I mean, if it's a utilities issue, clearly it's going to have to go to finance. Mm -hmm. but. I think we need to have one place where they can look at it more comprehensively. I what is it? What is it? I don't know what it is. That that's I, I think that's part of the problem is that I I don't know what it is. So that's what you're here to tell us. 
Well, I think maybe it might be useful for you to hear from, from Secretary Quinn as to what his view is. Uh, one of the things I, I thought was very interesting is we started dissecting uh, this roles and responsibilities issue. And, of course, we, we talk about the chief information officer. Well, he's the chief information officer for the executive branch. And you've got a separation of duties issue right out the gate because, you know, you have, uh, you have the judiciary and, and you have the legislature, and they're in very somewhat different places in terms of, of how they're structured, and the chief information officer can't necessarily tell them what to do. Before we started uh, our work on joint IT oversight, they didn't even meet. And we, we've got them now meeting on a regular basis together and collaborating, and clearly... <laughs> We believe. <laughs> we believe. <laughs> but, but clearly that, that's an issue. The, you, know, you have, obviously, the legislature somewhere intersects with the executive branch in terms of, of the Internet and, and, and some connectivity issues, but in other places, it doesn't. So can I ask another question? The, um, you don't have to ask okay. so, um, jump. So with regard to this uh, group, we're sitting here now, and then you have a number of different um, boards and commissions that are coming in afterwards. Do we relate to that to those people that are coming in? And if so, how? How can how can this panel be helpful with those boards and commissions? Well, I, I guess what you can do is, if if there are things on on those boards and commissions that you know right now that you've already looked at, share with us. Um, because yeah, we will be, you know, each board and commission that comes in here is handed a standard questionnaire that we ask about as to whether or not they should continue to exist. <laughs> if they, sh they should, what modifications, if any, should be made in legislation uh, with respect to what their mission is. Um, so that's basically what we'll be doing this afternoon with these various boards and commissions that are on our agenda today. Um, and you know anything that this roundtable discussion can help us in educating us as to what that is. And I mean, I should say that you know their coming in today is the first step in the process. Um, if we were to recommend the elimination of a board or commission, we would typically take testimony from other people who are interested parties. And so I know you have the Public Utility Commission, yeah, yeah, and the Department of Public Service on this list. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Oh, wow. And one of the one of the things is that one of the questions is I don't know if you guys saw the questions, but one of the questions is if your if your mission is still relevant, whatever it is that you were doing, could it be better accomplished someplace else? In, I mean, this this particular board needs to exist in order to to carry out that mission or to oversee whatever it is, and and we have heard from in other areas. People who've come in and said the mission is still relevant, but it could be better handled over here instead of by this board. We don't need this board. Is that good? So, before we get into some of that, can I just mention quickly a couple things, very briefly? Yeah. I know Senator Brock. Uh, I know oh, Secretary I'm sorry. Young. <laughs> I don't think I know Representative Brigland. Is that the yeah. That's correct. All right. I don't know. Uh, Good point, Matt. Let's Secretary all introduce ourselves. Okay. 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 Suzanne Starr. Uh, Suzanne Young, Secretary of Administration. John Quinn, Secretary of Digital Services and State CIO. Morris Villia, Chair of Joint IT Oversight and uh, on the House Energy and Energy. Oh, are you Project. from Dover? Yes. Okay. All right. There's a reason why I asked that. Do you keep track? Maybe I know somebody. Okay. I'm Senator Randy Brock. Uh, representing Franklin County and part of Grand Isle County, and I'm vice chair of uh, the Joint IT Oversight Committee. I'm Sue Zeller. I'm the state chief performance officer and one of the governor's non-legislative appointees to this commission. I'm Janet White, senator from Wyndham County, and I chair Senate Co-ops. John Gannon, state rep for Wilmington, Whitingham, and Halifax, um, and I co-chair this committee, and I'm vice chair of Co-ops. Senator Brian Collimore from the Rutland District. I'm Matt Krause. I'm one of the gubernatorial appointees. I'm Rob McClare. I'm a rep from Barrytown. Thank you, Matt. That 
was an oversight. <laughs> well, you looked him. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> sorry, yeah. 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 twice. <laughs> sorry, Tim. Okay. I'm Tim Briglin, and I'm a state rep from Thetford, and uh, I'm the chair of the Energy and Technology Committee. And the, the technology slice, um, very specifically, is not uh, technology writ large, it's technology and state government, um, very specifically. And um, the committee also has oversight on the House side of the building um, of telecommunications as well. Okay. Is, is my rep on your? Who's your rep? Heidi Sherman? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then I had a couple of quick points and then I'll be quiet. So I'm a 30 year state employee, so I'm going to direct this to Mr. Quinn. It's not a question, it's just a comment. For 30 years I served in state service. Every time we asked IT for something, the automatic response, or not automatic, but most of the occasions was, we can't do that. So <laughs> it was always frustrating to me in state service that that was the typical sort of default response. So all I would ask you to consider is that the default response is, we'll figure out a way to do that, okay? The second thing is, just very briefly, um, the, uh, I'm a very practical kind of person, and I always think that this is a huge subject. I mean, it's a, a, a really large subject. And I always think to the human being, you know, what is their, what would they like to see, what sort of solutions? And so for a couple of them, one, the feds are, are tackling uh, anonymous spam phone calls, which is, for as a citizen, I love. Take care of that. That's a problem for me. I get phone calls that say 802 all the time. That's good. I'm happy that they're doing that. I would ask you to consider as a group the same kind of thing. Focus on some very concrete solutions to problems. And one I'm sure you've always heard or continue to hear is coverage, cell coverage across the state. You know, you're in a car, you're traveling someplace, out it goes, and that type of thing. So. I would only ask you to consider as you take a look at the big subject, the, the large uh, entities, to not forget the little solutions that the average citizen would appreciate. I mean, the average citizen folks would focus on said that's a good thing. I like that. Okay, that's it. I'm done. Yeah, I would just add that, that I think you, you you've got a good point, but there's a, an enormous amount of work, not just something like the Joint IT Oversight Committee, but the committees of jurisdiction to deal with some of these issues like cell phone coverage. I know we did a lot of work between the Energy and Technology Committee in the House and Senate Finance, on which I serve, of uh, producing both a broadband bill and a bill designed to tackle the very points that you make. And I, I do have another bill that, that I'll be introducing this year. It's to reinstate capital punishment in Vermont. Now, it is limited, though. It will only apply to robocallers. What that bill, though, focuses on is uh, the work some other states are doing, like Indiana, for example, has a, adopted some criminal penalties and fines for robocallers, and people do get picked up nationally elsewhere, and the notion of uh, creating fines and so on for those people who get picked up in, in national sweeps. And Indiana, for example, has got something like $12 million in the past five years for robocallers as a result of their law. So we are doing something about it. Okay, from Don? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could like to hear from me? Yeah. That would be you. Sure. So, um, to echo some of what uh, Senator Brock said and what uh, Representative Spelia said, you know, things are still a little disjointed um, across state government, but what I would say is since 2017 when we created the Agency of Digital <coughs> Services, we've been focused on the executive branch. Each agency, each department had their own IT person or multiple people. And so, <coughs> excuse me, over the past couple of years, we've been reorganizing them and making us more efficient and trying to spend smarter uh, we've documented in the first two years uh, $5.5 million of cost avoidance uh, by being able to reuse what we already have across state government, being able to use employees across agencies rather than just in one agency where they may have been before 2017. Now if they have a specific skill set, we're able to look across the enterprise and pull those people around, which has been valuable to the enterprise overall and saves money. Um, so I think we've done some some good things uh, from that standpoint in regards to cybersecurity. When you look at um, the, the state's posture prior to 2017 and then now, 
we have visibility across the enterprise. We know uh, what we have and where we have it. We know what our assets are. We didn't before. Uh, we were, um, our risk to a cyber threat was much greater than it is now. It's still great. It's great for all states. But right now we're in a much better position to be able to not only stop an incoming threat, but be able to respond in a faster, uh, more coordinated way. So those are some of the things that we've done uh, in the executive branch as a new agency. Um, and those are just some of the highlights. But you know, some of the areas that aren't included in the Agency of Digital Services are separately elected offices. So whether it be the Attorney General's office or the Secretary of State's office, um, three branches of government, so the legislature, the judiciary, um, uh, radio services, and public safety. They, that's quasi-IT. They, they use a lot of technology to run their radio network, uh, but they have the expertise there, and we coordinate with them fairly closely on what they're buying and, and how it's being implemented to make sure certain security standards are being followed. Uh, the telecom piece um, still falls under the uh, public service department that's more regulatory and so we haven't you know that we leave that to them we do not get in that business um, and then there's e911 uh, which I think there's going to be a report by the secretary of administration Suzanne by the end of the year making some recommendations there but you know I, I look at that uh, myself and um, that it's going to be you know one of those things, sure they use IT, but so does every other agency out there um, to, to run their, their agency or their group. And then the HIT, the Health Information uh, Technology Plan, um, that's run out of human services, but we're uh, involved with that uh, through statute and through just uh, general oversight. So um, whether it be vital or any other organization um, that, that connects to our network, we look at their security standards to make sure whatever they're doing um, doesn't, doesn't increase our risk to a, a cyber threat. So they have to follow certain standards if they're going to connect to us. So a lot of valuable things that we've been doing, but there's still some you know, better coordination that could happen. Rob, you had a question? Um, well, I, I got a couple. I mean, it could be some. Um, one of the issues that, that seems that we, we've had, especially before the creation of your position, was that we never had the ability to quantify what we had, what we were spending on IT, what we had for resources in IT. Um, have, have we been, are we at a point now where we can say, you know, how many folks we have in IT, what we spend, say, on the executive branch side <coughs> on IT, and more importantly, what we have for in-house capability. Um, I've heard the example a few times, like the Health Connect. One of the reasons that it has been the ongoing, I guess I'd have to say failure, that it has been is that we just did not have the in-house capability to deal with, one, even what we were asking for, and two, to deal with it after the fact. Are we in a better place now in regards to that? And the last one is, is I know that on the human resources side, there's an awful lot of activity going on about dealing with legacy programs, mm -hmm. and all those come with an enormous price tag. Do we have a plan in place for that sort of stuff? I don't ask you a lot, but that's it. Okay, so I'll try to address some of those, unless if someone else wants it. <laughs> um, so we've done an inventory across state government um, before. We didn't know who was IT and who wasn't. We have about 386 IT professionals across state government. Um, that includes business analysts and project managers and IT managers and system developers. Um, we know what we have for assets. We know what we have for the no number of computers, the number of servers, the number of switches. We manage over 20,000 devices and 1,400 applications. That's about one application for every 6.5 state employees, which is a lot. Um, it's a lot of applications for that group to manage. There are about 10 security professionals for all of those applications. So that's one area. Um, we had, I think we had seven before the Agency of Digital Services. So as positions come up, as uh, vacancies come up, and we look at every single position very carefully to see, you know, what is, what is the skill set that we need? What is the priority? So we've transitioned three people to security already. We built a business office, which, you know, was a, a 
which was something that um, I overlooked in the beginning. Uh, we, we used AOA business services, and we really needed our own for the amount of services that we provided in the build back structure. So we moved a bunch of business office positions around and um, have a full full suite of uh, business office professionals, including payroll and those type of things. Are we, are we properly staffed or are, uh, do we have the right skill sets? In some areas, in some areas it's very challenging. So uh, system developers, people that are developing um, connections between systems, uh, people that are developing um, certain code for regulatory or legislative changes on legacy systems that are up to 40 years old. Uh, those are really challenging positions to, to fill. Um, they're, they're challenging not only for state government, but they're challenging for uh, Vermont employers, uh, just with the demographic issues, the unemployment, uh, the low unemployment rate. Um, Vermont doesn't have a, um, a large pool of IT professionals anyways across the state, so it becomes very challenging and uh, the, the, the structure that we have in place um, across the state as far as um, being able to telecommute broadband issues uh, makes it a little harder to hire outside of Chittenden County uh, for the most part. And so, do we have the right skill sets? Not necessarily. Uh, we hire out and do staff augmentation where we can't find those. We do um, private, um, we use companies, um, you know, inside and outside of the state, preferably in the state where we can, but uh, it's been a challenge for us to staff our offices. And I think the, I missed the last question. Uh, it's the legacy systems, yeah. yes. You know, that, that's, that's a challenging thing for us. I think we've been talking about it quite a bit as an administration. How do we move forward with um, IT? How do we keep up with the changing landscape? How do we fund these IT systems that are, you know, anywhere from a million dollars to forty million dollars or higher, right? And how do we do it on, in uh, in a way that's sustainable? Um, and so, you know, one of the things my agency is looking to do is uh, consolidate towards platforms. Con talk, consolidate towards. Um, I, I'm trying to think of something that everyone would know, like you could call Microsoft a platform, right? Something that's common to everyone, a common email type of client. Get everyone on those type of email clients, which will reduce the number of staff that we need internally, um, and uh, focus our skill set in certain areas rather than focusing on 1,400 different areas and trying to keep skill sets. We're trying to narrow those down. One of the other areas is case management. We have hundreds of case management tools across the state. We're, consol we're consolidating where we can to one platform. Right? Everyone may still have a separate instance, but we're gonna focus on getting everyone on that platform rather than needing 40 people to manage that. We may only need 10 people in the future. So we're focused on things like that, and that's how we're trying to get off the legacy systems. Technology's changing every day, which makes it challenging. Um, but by focusing on um, those cloud type of solutions where we get out of the business of having to upgrade, you know, every time we do an upgrade on our ERP system, for example, it's three and a half or four million dollars. We have to do one of those every three or four years. We want to get out of that model. We want to move to the cloud software uh, as a service where the company that's hosting that has to do those updates and we're continually up to date. So we'll level out the, the spending projection and be able to plan longer term because we'll know with that company we'll see an average increase of 4% or 6%, but it'll always be up to date and always secure. Brian, I'm, I'm good, okay. thank you. Brian? It's something I just want to follow up on, sure. uh, because I think it, um, it, it tracks with what Secretary Clinton was saying, and it's something more that the legislature has to consider. It might not be in the purview of your committee, but is thinking about how we actually go about funding uh, IT. And you know, I think there's a traditional mindset of um, it's a capital expenditure. When we're funding IT, we're you know buying a bunch of big boxes that we're putting on people's desks, and they're going to sit there for 10 years mm -hmm. until we replace them um, 10 years later. And we've moved way beyond that as a society. And how we um, fund a lot of IT expenditure in our in our budgetary process is through the capital budget. And uh, I know I know that drives uh, that committee crazy because a lot of this expenditure is 
really general fund type expenditure. It's annual um, uh, operating expenses. And I think real innovative private sector companies no longer think of their IT spending as this is a capital expenditure. It's something that we put on our books and depreciate over 10 years. You know, these are annual expenditures. Um, as Secretary Quinn was saying, a lot of this stuff is subscription services that you're paying for year after year, things that are updated, but it's not uh, a pay for it and forget it type of project and then we'll come back to it in 10 years. These, these are expensive expenditures that go over time. And um, in a perfect world, and we're a long way from there, this would be more general fund uh, focused as opposed to things that we bond for and pay for over time. I think one of the things that also we ought to be thinking about is the strategic changes in the way IT is being run. Uh, we've learned, for example, from Vermont Health Connect that this massive, large project, as opposed to what we're doing now, and I think Secretary Quinn can perhaps address it more specifically about cutting things into smaller chunks so that we can measure them and then uh, adding oversight both from the IT Oversight Committee and from the Joint Fiscal Committee and others to look at those chunks as they're being done to measure how we're doing relative to what it is we're, we're trying to do so that we can stay both on budget and on target. And John, you may, you may want to expand on, on, on the strategic changes. Yeah, I, I think, you know, when you, when you look at how we um, would go about a big monolithic system like my Health Connect before, it was all one, it was all integrated, every piece connected in some way. And, one piece failed, the whole thing went down, right? We're, build, we're now building the integrated eligibility platform, for example, in modular right. small pieces. So we can measure out each piece, monitor each piece. And if we only get through three of the pieces and we have to you know, change our priorities and cut funding, we have three pieces that will improve the lives of the of Vermonters, right? They'll be able to use those pieces. We'll be able to build off from them. It won't be a failure because we'll have things that we can actually use, things that we've spent money on. It's where the old approach was, well, we only got part way through the project. There's no real functionality that works yet. And so this, the change there in strategic direction is, you know, is, is definitely a lesson learned from the past, and it's not something just Vermont has learned, it's, it's nationwide. So I want to follow up, if I could, sure. on both Secretary Quinn's remarks and Senator Brock and forgive me if I'm three steps behind, because I feel like I am, but mm. from the perspective of a priest from a small parish, here we go. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know whether this is a legitimate perspective or not, but many of us can remember the EP, EB5 diagram that showed, in essence, a bunch of spaghetti-looking stuff. And that's how I feel about the way we are right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether it's feasible or reasonable that we at some point will have one person Ms. or Mr. IT that can control everything or not. And I don't know whether we should. So I guess I'm, I'm still trying to get a handle on who controls what, because we've had issues in, in GovOps before where something happened, and then we went back to say, well, who was in charge? Why, how, how did this happen? And what decision was made along the way that, that allowed this to happen? And we kind of like didn't get an answer. Can, can I follow up on that? Just the, um, and I know that you fo you're focusing on state, the state government system, but how do how do we integrate that with? What's the role here with non-state government systems out yeah. there? I, mean, I know the Public Utilities Commission regulates utilities, the regulated utilities, but what what's our role? with those other, that other world out there that isn't in state government? And how do we, how do we integrate that? And do we have any control in terms of? Well, I don't know in terms of getting answers to who made, what decision was made, when, why did this fail? Why did this well, happen? This is the spaghetti that, yeah. that I think that, that, yeah. that Senator Collimore is talking about. And there is spaghetti here. There's no question mm -hmm. about that. Uh, because we're dealing with, A, some things that are totally outside of our control, for example, those things that are federally preempted that are still inter inter interconnected with what we do. Uh, one of the things in terms of looking at a governance structure, it's very difficult to take a governance structure and put one person in charge of everything uh, because we have different organizations, different branches of government, uh, different uh, 
uh, agencies that have, have systems that they have to manage. And that's why I'm suggesting that at least as, as in effect as an interim step that we should be thinking about dotted lines as opposed to a whole bunch of single lines. Because there are responsibilities in, in, in terms of things like technology, technology standards, uh, information security standards and so on that should be consolidated really across government. And that to me is the role of a chief information officer. And that's normally the way it's done in the private sector. But at the same time, people who own businesses within government, such as the agencies and departments and independent offices, they have responsibility for their own systems and there is a command and control piece there. The, the dotted line and direct line have to integrate with each other. The dotted line is standards, it's, it's, it's consistency, it's those kinds of things that get driven through government. Uh, on the other hand, uh, agencies do need to control uh, their own system because they're responsible for managing them on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so there will be a degree of spaghetti, but not the kind of spaghetti that we saw in the EB-5 diagram. Uh, I think one of the things that we have been talking about on the IT Oversight Committee, though, is on the governance structure, taking it a little more slowly to really define what it is and how it ought to work, and that may be the kind of study that needs to be done between now and and the session beginning in 2021 to create a structure that really works uh, and that has thought through all of these things rather than our doing so on, uh, on, on the spur of the moment. So it's kind of a two-step process that, that at least I, and I don't know if I speak with, for everybody on the IT Oversight Committee, uh, just think that may be an, an appropriate way to manage this. I have, so, sorry, I guess I have a question. So where does the overall vision, where do we think that's coming from? For instance, like, Something as simple as should something be cloud-based or, I don't know what the term is, site-based, mm -hmm. server-based, okay. Um, and my sense is like when I heard you say that we've got like 1,400 <coughs> different type of programs that we're trying to mm -hmm. stay on top of, who, who's going to have this say as to whether how customized a program is versus you're just going to have to deal with what's out there commercially and figure it out? Where, where does that happen? That's obvious. I can jump in. Um, I really appreciate having this conversation because it's a very important one. You've touched on funding, you've touched on infrastructure, you've touched on governance. And I have a few more years on you um, in state government. And I recall in the AG's office when we built our own system and we owned it and we built on it. And it's really very recently in my last um, tenure in the AG's office that um, this notion that we're du duplicating mm -hmm. other, other mm -hmm. systems out there in state government um, came to really anyone's consciousness and that we can do better and we can start working with other agencies and departments on similar platforms. But 2017 and the creation of the Agency of Digital Service I think it was just the absolute right Thing to do and I think it's been very successful from my um, perspective as a consumer um, and as the head of an agency and also the one that has to sort of figure out how are we going to pay for our IT needs so I will just echo that I think we are it's going to take a while but we're starting to unwind the spaghetti at least internal to state government um, that we are talking at the cabinet level at the enterprise level about our IT needs we're um, starting to talk about what are priorities for each of our agencies and, and how are we going to fund those and what's going to be the funding source. And that has been a conversation we couldn't have had, I think, any more, any earlier than, than this, this summer because of the work that Secretary Quinn and his um, team have done in terms of inventorying our assets, inventorying our needs, and inventorying the risks and the cyber risks. And so I think a lot of work has gone into that. It's going to be very fruitful to this conversation. Um, we purchased cybersecurity, you know, for the first time as a state. It hasn't been a product that's been out there for very long, but you know, we've started um, to really look at at IT as an enterprise basis instead of each little program or department has their own thing that they build that they own. 
Um, so moving to platforms, uh, Secretary Quinn's been great. If you have a need, it's like, well, we have we have this over here that will help. Don't go duplicate, you mm -hmm. know, efforts. So I, I can't say enough about I think the work that's been done to date that's going to help inform the conversation. I think when you talk about outside um, IT, when we need to go to outside contractors, I think that we've got a pretty robust review. Um, process for certain projects uh, again at ADS where we're applying the standards that we want all our contractors to to comply with in terms of privacy cybersecurity and the like um, and I think that that's you know critical to when we have to go outside and I think the real nut to crack is the things that are circling around outside us that rely on IT to deliver services and telecom I mean it's become a much more um, compressed world, I think, than when it was all separate. And, um, so I think that's the real, the real challenge for all of us is the telecom piece of it and the federal government's preemption on cable and um, the like. And I'll, I'll just add to that that I mean, um, ADS is the is the internal executive branch agency of digital services. Mm -hmm. And while John and his people are responsible for what goes on in the executive branch, not including the separately elected offices, um, he is also responsible for how the state entity of IT integrates outside, but not for things like outside telecommunications and you know all corporate other things. Um, and as to funding, I would make a comment um, um, that Representative Briglin made about the general fund. One of the reasons we have like hundreds of um, of uh, customer management systems and you know case management systems is the federal government. Because historically, each individual you know CFDA <laughs> number would say, "Oh, you can use this money to buy tea." So everyone went out and bought it, and so they have been a large contributor to the reason we have um, the problem that we have. I mean, I remember I um, staffed a committee that was made up of Mike Sherling, um, who was uh, the head of the Burlington Alive at the time, Burlington, you know, Bright, whatever the heck that thing was called. And um, uh, one of the guys from um, my web grocer. And anyway, so the three of them, and we did a review of IT, and one of the, um, one of the things that was uh, really interesting is when we were talking to all of AHS about at the time trying to do the two hundred million dollar giant access project and I remember some of the testimony was like well yeah but if we build it this way and this is the way we don't want to do it we can cover these other 60 programs could you not just build what yet what you have to build for could you keep it at what you need which is an eligibility system um, so the the federal money is a real, um, you know, it's a real temptation for people to just run out and get it and spend it and and not think about the long term implications. Having ADS there as a as a bridge against that to say, okay, let's see what you want, let's see what you need, let's see what other people have. Can we work this together? Can we take what someone has and add you to it? It's so much, it's so, such a better conversation than just run out and get that federal money. But the feds have not been helpful. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they have been part of the reason we have the structure that we have. Mm -hmm. That isn't true just with IT. That's oh, no, that's program. true with they anything. Have, yeah. yeah, they mm -hmm. have. It's yeah. very tempting to set up a it's, program. Absolutely. Yeah. So, how do we. Uh, oh, I think I'm sorry. I just, I just, uh, first of all, I want to mention that Sue's doing a great job on this commission, so I want to put a plug in. You're his, her boss, right? Oh, yes. Okay, I just well, want to put that plug exactly. in and let you know like you're doing a great job. So, yeah. Okay. Well, you got to quantify great. Uh, oh, thanks. I did have a couple of uh, things that I just wanted to bring up. First of all, um, I'm appreciative that the state created a an agency for the digital services. That's a, a real big promotion. And I'm glad that they centralized everything that's important too. I used to work spent my entire career in the Department of Human Resources and in the last couple of years it was very good about getting notices that uh, somebody had opened something up 
uh, it opened up a uh, virus, et cetera, don't do it, et cetera. So it was fast response, and I really appreciate that. But I do have a couple of uh, things that are of concern to me. There's 7,000 state employees, and many of them have access to terminals. And uh, with the best of intentions, sometimes people access stuff they're not supposed to. Uh, and the last I had heard when I left state service that VSEA was going to work with the state on uh, ensuring that uh, employees weren't um, uh, spied upon, but that their, the places that they were accessing, et cetera, were going to be uh, controlled, if you will. Okay, so that's one thing that sort of, uh, there were a lot of folks who uh, I was told, I'm not a big Facebook person, but they're on Facebook all the time, or e e eBay, or something of that nature. So that's kind of a not a good thing for uh, state employees to be using those services. Um, I wanted to know if, uh, in the cybersecurity field, you were accessing Norwich University. They have a very uh, big program over there for cybersecurity. We are. You are. Okay. So. Yeah, okay, and then just one other piece. Uh, where does AI fit in this? Because I assume this is, it, Brian mentioned who's the big boss going to be, and in a few years it'll be AI. I mean, that's a, you know, they'll be controlling all of this and you'll have input into it, but they'll be making the decisions and, and using uh, uh, various apps, et cetera, to control it all. It won't be a, perhaps an individual, but AI fits in here someplace. Let's put it that way. So, so I do. The only one I want to have maybe a comment was the sort of VSEA. That's the last I'd known that VSEA and the state were discussing sort of how 7,000 state employees were going to use these new terminals, the services that were available, making sure that citizens got their money's worth. Right. So I, I'm not going to go into human resources policy at all, but what I will say is that the tools that we've been uh, installing or implementing across uh, what I would call our perimeter, um, our intrusion detection system and prevention right. system, looks for certain types of URLs, looks for certain types of websites. We block those at the at the gateway into our into our perimeter, <coughs> right? So mm -hmm. um, the ones that we know about that are just downright bad, we block those right away to make to make sure that we're uh, preventing ransomware and viruses from coming in. It's not 100% foolproof, none of them are. Right. Um, but a lot of that stuff is blocked on the outside. Um, at this time, we, we don't monitor usage of state. You do not? I, no, my okay. agency is not in charge of monitoring um, <coughs> time usage of state employees. That would be a question for, uh, you know, uh, Department of Human Resources, but uh, we haven't been instructed with implementing anything like that. But overall, uh, the tools that we've been putting in place are really to mitigate the risk if employees do stumble onto a website that may be harmful to the state government data. So, and I would add one of the risks that we're currently trying to get our hands around um, on um, with, at the Joint IT Oversight is what risk legislators pose oh, yeah. to the systems. <laughs> um, we're, you know, we're working to put together a class for legislators, as well as, you know, our municipalities who, you know, are tying into these systems. So. I, I think it really, it'd be really good to touch on the Norwich University thing for a second. Um, two years ago, I believe it was two years ago, we, we created a partnership with Norwich University to uh, bring in uh, cyber talent into the workforce, into the state workforce, and to uh, give students the opportunity to work in an um, environment that has about every type of technology you can think of here, right? You know, we have legacy technology that's 40 years old that's hard to secure. Uh, we have new technology. We have everything in between. So mm -hmm. we've created this partnership uh, that does uh, not only internships, but a security operations center at Norwich University where students can uh, get real-world experience watching uh, our uh, log data coming in from our firewalls and things like that and detecting uh, potential intrusions or mm -hmm. attempts at intrusions into our network. So it's, it's been a really good partnership and I think uh, it's benefited the state. I think we've hired three people from uh, the program already uh, full-time. So it, it's definitely been 
you know, one of the better things we've done. All the states are having a hard time hiring cyber talent, but this seems to be working out really well for us. Good. Okay. So, thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, I would also add Norwich has helped coordinate this cyber class that um, hopefully will have legislators taking as well as municipalities. Um, I'm an alumni of Norwich, and I'm really so pleased that in. they, well, I don't want to put a plug in, but I'm pleased yeah. that they, as an academic institution, they don't sort of sit on in an ivory tower, that they're out there into the community, into the, you know, where they can help out, uh, you know, resources or the organizations in a state, okay, we're small, uh, anything that they can do to assist is, is really vital, it's important. One of the other things I, I failed to mention was <clears throat> we implemented a, a security awareness training program for our state employees. Um, the last time I looked, we had, I think, 4,600 people that had taken the awareness training and walked you through different modules, whether you know it's identifying an email that may be a, a spam or phishing attempt or you know how to identify websites or links that maybe you shouldn't click on. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just bought a new software that's going to further refine um, that effort and be able to <laughs> offer more trainings in depth uh, over the course of the year. And the last Thank thing you. I would add is uh, we did pass an AI commission. We created an AI commission a couple of years ago. I saw some. I, I don't. Yeah. I'm not in, as in tune with yeah. a legislature, uh, with a legislative member. Is there? There. Yeah. You know. Um, more closely attuned to what's taking place. I heard something about that, but yeah. you know, AI is going to connect to all of these things in some fashion. Like I say, you know, AI is going to be able, they'll be able to manage every all the information that's coming along and coming in. So. Yeah, I mean, I know that you are talking in the future tense, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not present tense. Okay, sorry. So, <laughs> and it's growing. So two Thank things. You. First of all, um, our sorry. IT staff at the legislature has me so nervous about clicking on anything That's good. Mm -hmm. that That's good. my family gets really annoyed at me when they send me a link to something and I say, don't trust you, I'm not opening it. But anyway. Is um, that why you didn't check your email? <laughs> <laughs> I delete, 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 delete. <laughs> but we tell people not to click on any emails from Hormel because they may contain spam. Ah. Oh. That's a good one. So, I'm, you had me a capital punishment. <laughs> so, I'm kind of going back a step here. I'm a little concerned that, just given what you were talking about with the federal preemption, that we can't. Is there any governance structure at all that can look that can? Somehow, I, I, and I don't know what it is, but you're, you're talking about two different things, Senator. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when we look at, so what John is not, Secretary Quinn is not. Uh, no, I'm not talking about state. Okay. I'm not talking about the state here. The okay. State government. Okay. Uh, no, I, I'm going back farther to okay. where Brian and I were about in the, the wild world out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That it seems to me we need some focal point that um, looks at kind of the world of IT out in Vermont, not in state government necessarily. And I don't know what that is. I don't know what it looks like. But how, how do we do that? We, we just heard from the State Board of Education. They apparently have no authority to do anything, but they do things, but they're their goal is to look at the kind of world of education and make recommendations to the agency and to the governor and to the legislature. But do, is there any such thing that we can create or have that would do that same thing? Or is that your role? I, I don't know. I, I'm talking you, about outside of state yeah, government so that yeah. we can so you're talking do we about have infrastructure. Any control right. over mm -hmm. the horizons yeah. of the world and the AT&Ts and when we ask them questions and they just say, oh. could I just I, um, I don't know. Could I just bring us back to what our mission is for the well, Sunset Advisory Committee yes. and commission and that I think it was very valuable for us as a commission to hear from um, these five people on 
on the uh, variety of, and complexity of the situation. Mm -hmm. But the primary goal, seems to me here, was to get testimony to help us in our yes. deliberation about these committees yes. so that we understand a little bit better. Okay. Right. N not um, that I'm not wanting to talk about the greater world, but um, it seems to me that that's probably um, something that the legislature as a whole needs to work on with, you know, contact yeah, with yeah. the administration. But for, for purposes of this, I think we should, um, if we need any more information that will help us in our deliberations about the remaining um, committees and boards that we're looking at today, I think we should ask those questions, but sort of the wider discussion about governance and outside of state government, I think we should probably leave to the so, committees of jurisdiction. Well, that's what I was wondering if they, these people in their wisdom mm -hmm. could say, well, one of these mm -hmm. is, yeah. is something that could expand into that, what I was thinking, or okay. none of these are, or you should eliminate all of these and start all yes. over again, or... So you have what? different <laughs> focuses on stuff. So, right. like, the agency is mm -hmm. all internal, right? right? Yes. And then you look at the PUC mm -hmm. and the department, and those are really looking ex external. external. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, at our infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? Um, the property parcel data is um, municipalities. Mm -hmm. no, what's the web ADS. portal board? Web portal board so is, is, ADS. is, um, is uh, electronic oh, transaction YouTube. state government conducts yeah. for mm -hmm. money, you know, like permits and licenses. And stuff. Just, mm -hmm. just, just for a little clarity, the, the parcel data advisory board, um, John Adams is actually an employee of ADS. Mm -hmm. They run the mm -hmm. geographic mm -hmm. information center and provide maps and data to towns, municipalities, state entities. So we are out, outward facing a little bit uh, with that group. So I mean, are you going through like the E911 board is coming in and I'm just wondering if that's, uh, is that something that could potentially fall underneath, you know, the purview of the Agency of Digital Services? That's well, that I think Suzanne so, has uh, yeah. The legislature has tasked the Secretary of Administration <laughs> looking at that very question, uh, which is where should the E911 board reside, if not in its current iteration as an independent board. Um, and when you look at their functions, they have IT function, they have, um, they have uh, the telecom function, they have the public safety function. I mean, they they are kind of crossing a lot of different areas that fit in different parts of state government. So um, it's it's not a new conversation. I've gone back and looked at several reports and studies over the last decade that have tried to crack the nut of the E911 board and where, where they should reside or should they move to public safety. So we're looking at that now and the report's due in January. And um, you know, we asked that. for that report in particular mm -hmm. for, for right. the very reasons that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, that Secretary Young has mentioned. Uh, it, we've seen failures. And it's mm -hmm. the kind of failure it, it, at the end of the day when a person can't get an E911 call through, uh, I know a question I asked in Senate Finance is, who do we blame? And the problem is there are a number of fingerprints on it, and that goes back to the spaghetti chart. Mm -hmm. And that's why I lean towards having uh, at least some dotted line responsibility to the technology piece, the chief information officer, because there is an information and there's an information transmission role that's there. Standard setting, monitoring, oversight as opposed to direct responsibility can link some of this stuff together better than it is being done right now because we do have holes uh, and we have serious holes. Yeah. Oh. Many more to come. Can I just make uh, one comment? I, we haven't really heard from you, Representative mm -hmm. Friedman, so maybe a couple minutes. But following up on Sue's point, we're the Sunset Advisory Commission we like the sunset organization. <laughs> That's our, we really get excited about that. I know it's a surgeon's got a knife, yeah, you got a cut. You know, <laughs> you've got a nail with a hammer. But we're, you know, so if there's any organization that's listed here or other ones that you know of that uh, have outlived their usefulness, we're certainly pleased to 
hear that information, but I, I do just want to give you a, I don't want to take the chance yeah, responsibility, yeah. but just to give you, I didn't really, we really So the PUC, heard. I think, absolutely, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I just suggested that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That'll make some news. Um, uh, I think uh, Senator Collimore's, uh question is the key one that I think you should have front and center as you're thinking about, um, again, whether to cut, whether to um, uh, turn the dial slightly on what some of these um, commissions might be focused on and what your recommendation is back to the legislature, which is accountability. Um, you know, as I look at these different uh, commissions and boards and how they're set up and having heard um, uh, Mr. Carroll who's a constituent of mine and, and uh, Mr. Peltz uh, uh, testify earlier as a legislator and uh, a chair of a, of a um, committee that has oversight we're always looking for who's the neck we can choke who's you know something goes wrong who do you reach out for and um, as Senator Brock said also is, you know, when you have the spaghetti structure, uh, you know, you, you, what you reach out for and grab is a handful of sand, and there's, you know, there's nothing there to really hold accountable. So um, I, I would say that's issue number one, mm -hmm. uh, looking at these different boards, where's the accountability and what's the function? Um, the, the boards that you're looking at this afternoon, uh, I, my sense is, some of them I've, been, I've never had interaction with. Um, but play very different functions. Um, some of these boards operate with kind of an executive capacity. They actually have um, functions where they are, um, they have oversight of an executive uh, that reports to them, and that's a very different function than an advisory board. And that's not to say that an advisory board isn't important, and let me make a pitch for one, which is, um, I think uh, I agree with what's been said today in terms of um, ADS plays a very important function in state government that we didn't have before, which is pulling together um, from different parts of state government a function that was, uh, I don't want to say out of control, but to, again, there was no accountability for it. And now we have an agency that has the capability of doing that, um, certainly the mandate. Um, but, you know, where, um, uh, you know, where that goes in different parts of state government, for example, the legislature. The legislature has a committee that deals with IT within the legislature. Um, where that goes with regard to Secretary Quinn's oversight of the Secretary of State's office, the Treasurer's office, the AG's office, that accountability is not there. And do we want to consider as a state government you know, more oversight there? Um, but in terms of um, an advisory role, um, IT and, and cybersecurity changes so frequently that I think there really is an important role for a third party independent um, advisory role to state government, to ADS on cybersecurity, where you've got kind of the best minds in Vermont who are working on cybersecurity who can give an outside perspective, whether it's to the secretary or other parts of state government that deal with IT. I think, it's, I think this is a, a place that's very fertile ground to have that type of advice um, and that kind of cross-fertilization, if you will. And it's because it's such a, uh, it's an area that is subject to so much change. Um, and I, I will say that's in contrast to many other parts of state government where, you know, things just, you know, policy changes move at a much more measured pace. This stuff is changing daily. And I think it's important as high a caliber um, or, you know, maybe there's a need for improvement we have within state government. I think we need people from outside state government advising us on what best practices are. So I would make a pitch for uh, there's an advisory role here that's, that's very important. And there's one other role that we haven't really talked about, and it may be outside of the purview of what you're doing on a Sunset Advisory Commission, is I think we need a much stronger audit role because there needs to be not just the oversight and work being done within state government. We need uh, to have an independent set of eyes to look at IT problems from an auditor's perspective. We have one IT auditor uh, in state government right now, the same as we've had for the past 15 years. And IT has played a, a, place, a much stronger role, a much more prominent role in what we do right now. And that, I believe, is a real inadequacy that needs to be addressed. So I assume, mm -hmm. Senator Brock, your one IT auditor is not sufficient for... <coughs> 
No. And, and to hire people to come in and do outside reviews yeah. is extremely expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Extremely expensive. And this is also a problem that we've looked at overall uh, in our work on the Joint IT Oversight Commission is, are we able, at the salaries that we pay in state government, to hire the people that we really need at the level of expertise that we need? And so what we wind up doing, and we, this was a classic example we saw in Vermont Health Connect. We didn't have the horsepower to do the work, and we weren't able to hire them at state government salaries, even inflated to market factor analysis. And so as a result, we go out to a contractor, and we pay four times the rate that we would pay if we had the person on our staff in the first place. And that, again, is something that we, we've enlisted the human resources folks to, to, to look at to perhaps give us some guidance in that regard, too. And this is some place that I think has also moved uh, uh, in a different direction in the private sector in the last 10 years, which is 10, 15, 20 years ago, you went to the private sector and looked at um, places that used to be considered, you know, I'll say cost centers in most private businesses, which was human resources and IT, um, have really changed their strategic focus. Um, you look at any uh, private sector business worth their while now, and they are looking at um, human resources and IT as that's a core um, that's a core strength of the business and people who are involved in those areas are major strategic players in the organization you know it's not you know it's not the uh, you know IT used to be a backwater and that's not the case in in well-functioning organizations now it's a strategic role and I think uh, it's important that we think of you know from your perspective as you look at state commissions and and who's working on these issues it's a major strategic function and we have to have kind of best minds and practices kind of looking at that it's not this is not a backwater it's, it's kind of it's central to what we do so one thing that, that concerns me, I've heard from a number of people, is the lack of oversight of the non-executive um, groups, whether it's the legislature or the Secretary of State's office. It, it, is any effort being made now to consolidate oversight with respect to those other um, non-executive agencies? I mean, because it seems like if they're not part of, if they're not under the oversight of ADS, um, they may be doing things that are, are good from a cyber security or other perspectives. So we are not, we have not come forward yet with our final recommendations, but, um, and that is not one that we've been talking about. What we've been talking about at this point is just having the three branches come together to talk on a regular basis, which was not happening. So, you know, and then you've got these outside independently elected offices, et cetera. So, you know, the notion of creating a cyber council, um, certainly the governor has a cyber council, a cyber security <coughs> council. Um, you know, which I think may have a little bit different uh, scope. Um, but I think there's room for looking at that, for sure. But that also is a role of, that the auditor's office is uniquely able to play to go across those branches in state government to look at problems throughout uh, throughout the enterprise, which is why I, I do emphasize that. And, and Senator Brock, do you think currently the auditor is focused enough on, on these technology issues? Well, if the auditor were given a, a, an armored car load of money to be able to fund the hiring of the, the kind of expensive services necessary to provide that oversight, that may be the case. But right now, it's, it's not staffed to be able to do it, and he's not funded to be able to do it. And the auditor's office is also one of those independently yeah. yes. right. elected offices. So, yeah. um, so they, there's they, that they challenge, What they too. do and what they don't do, right? Yeah. Well, the legislator can certainly ask them to do yeah. some things. And yeah. generally, you can expect that they will be responsive to that. But we've not asked. And if we're, are we losing money by not asking? I mean, are, are we, would we be better off paying the money up front to have the audit? Done than to lose well, money it's, by all of this this work would, <laughs> would be would be done obviously in, in increments and, and prioritization. But to ask the auditor's office just to look at information technology risk in a general term, come back with a, a, a plan for doing that, that might be something that that, that might be worth doing. Okay. Uh, I know we've had conversations uh, with the auditor's office. We've had the auditor in. Uh, uh, I think he's due to come back to us with just some additional information. Uh, that we asked for uh, about approaching the subject. We are looking at um, a recommendation around cyber standards 
um, you know, how <coughs> do we have the means to, you know, putting something like that in, in statute, um, as well as notification on breach, breaches of systems. Um, you know, it's it's been it's been interesting to learn what we don't know. So, am I hearing that part of the conversation really is how much of this do we try to do in house, as opposed to outsourcing it? Is is that part of the the debate, or some of the? I think we. I'm a plan person, so I think we really have to, you know, like think about what are the next objectives that we have here, and then figure out if we have the capacity in state government. I think you know we're hearing a lot. Uh, about the value of outside independent audit, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm just. We've talked about potentially adding, um, recommending adding some capacity at um, JFO. Uh, we have Dan Smith there mm -hmm. on IT projects. You know, is there the ability? Should we should we add some capacity there for cyber mm -hmm. security? You know. Just work it up right. We, we. You don't, you don't use any. Is it highway? Is it highway? Oh, tar, it's the Chinese. The, the Chinese. Yeah. Well, you don't use any of that. Huawei. 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 Thank you. No, and, and given the escalation of my role in 2017, we were able to uh, quickly uh, issue a directive to the all of state government saying that we won't be using that type of technology. There were uh, six or seven types of technologies that we banned based on federal guidance. Okay, all right. Yep. Oh, I'm up. Except D911 has some of that, don't they, John? No. Oh, they don't? No, there was... Got rid of that? There was some um, um, Huawei equipment in a data center that um, had been decommissioned but okay. still in the rack. And, all right. Uh, but yes, there is none in the E911 system that I'm aware of. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Who's on the committee? I'm just curious, on your oversight committee. Just the three of you? Uh, no, no, it's uh, myself, um, Seth Chase, who's also from Energy and Technology, Marty Feltus from Appropriations, Senator Brock, Senator Pearson, and... Um, Senator Kitchell. Senator Kitchell. <coughs> Well, I'm so glad we were able to solve all the issues today. <laughs> <laughs> what is the so what is what the is, issue that you would like to solve, Madam Chair? I would like to have us solve have some kind of. That's what I was trying to ask about with the advisory. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if these groups, if these boards and commissions are the right ones to have. And some of them may be so specific that they need to exist, and some of them may not. But I I. Um, what I was trying when I was comparing it to the Board of Education is I was thinking about what Tim actually said very eloquently is that we we need to have some kind of an independent um, body out there that is made up of those leaders in that and I wondered if that's what we need I to, to advise the state on um, where to go, cybersecurity, what to do, what to think about, um, without having it be a um, governmental body. I, I, I just, and I don't know if one of these can fill that role. If I, I, I don't know. Are you talking about creating a new board? Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 So, in the create as well as sum, can we summarize yeah. as well? Yeah. In the summarize. In the in the um, in the five minutes we have left, with the exception of the fact that John, you're going to testify on the work for the board later. Does anybody uh, of of our guests or um, have anything that they would like to add specifically about? these boards and commissions that are on our agenda for the rest of the day? Good question. Very cool. I noticed a few were removed <coughs> so um, from the, the initial agenda, so I think there were was quite a bit of obsolescence on the first 
agenda. Um, and now I think you're going to hear from the E911 board, mm -hmm. and that's a work in progress in terms of governance and whether it should be advisory or not. Um, property parcel data advisory board seems to, to be one that's functioning, but you're going to have to hear from them and, and mm -hmm. lots of a role for municipalities, um, the PUC, and mm -hmm. again, and the Department of Public Service, which is a totally different ballgame that I would mm -hmm. not even profess to have um, the thought of abolishing without great thought and, and, in, and insight into that. Um, and the Web Portal Board, which does serve um, a function in state government, the sec two secretaries are represented on that board. Um, my representative, who's not here this week, um, you know, says he's um, pretty excited that there's a little bit of new energy and new direction on that board, which I expect Secretary Quinn will fill you in on. But as far as other boards uh, um, related to IT, I didn't come up with any others that I think are still in existence or functional. So, um, <coughs> I noticed you had vital on your, your uh, yeah. 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 I was a little confused by that because I didn't really look at, at vital, uh, at least the vital board as a creation of state government, but that's more of a semi-autonomous entity that has been charged by state government with a particular function. Right. I wasn't sure it was in the purview of this board to sunset that board, but maybe it is. Wow. We might. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that it is in our purview, but yeah. our what our role is, I think, is to look at them and then to say, is there um, is there a recommendation? And yep. it would be, I would assume, health and welfare, yep. and that would take that up along with the administration. <coughs> and then, and and if and if it's still functioning the way, right. then are there legislative changes? Mm -hmm. that need to be made to make it more appropriate to what they're actually doing now than what they might have been doing when they were created. Right. With yeah. the mapping perspective, it, it is, and it's their job to prove to us that we're not supposed to. Okay. <laughs> Good. But did you say there were ones that were on the initial list that aren't on well, there now? Well, there were some really obsolete ones that intrigued me. The, commission, the committee to examine strategies to enhance software information, a technology <laughs> sector, so well, I mean, things that were in session law that have since sunset right. by themselves. Yeah. And have they sunsetted by themselves? Yeah. Or? yeah. Yeah, I mean, they had a report due in January, and I'm assuming they don't exist anymore. In January 2013, so there were some, um, at least on the initial yeah. agenda that I, I saw. I think Benji may have the information on that. Okay, excuse me. Because some, some, some of them, some boards we found that they were created to re produce a report, but right. they still exist in statute. They never yeah. were, they, they never went away. Mm -hmm. Or they're in session law, and they are gone. Betsy will. I think she is. Well, looks like you had in light in us. Today. Um, I would put in a, for the Telecom and Connectivity Advisory Board, um, where that's a board that's making grants. I think it's good to keep some transparency there. Is this the one that's doing the grants that's for it. the, whatever those little things are? Uh, yeah. no. That was really technically uh, 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 explicit. <laughs> 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 no, she's talking about coverage go in the radios. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no okay. that would be the department. Um, oh, okay. This is with the Universal Service Fund Connectivity, oh. Connectivity Initiative. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And so keeping that kind of separate board, I think, is just good for. Good hygiene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything? Any others on there? Vermont uh, Equipment uh, Distribution Program Advisory Council. I guess we'll hear from them, but yeah, yeah, I can yeah. Hear that when I speak. Yeah. All right. <coughs> There are some, and I and I don't know. Um, I'm not right off. I can't pinpoint exactly what those two boards do, but there are um, some folks that are very specifically affected by programs that staff some of these boards. And again, there's a sunlight yeah. factor mm -hmm. there, making sure that things are happening. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And I guess we'll hear from them this afternoon. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank, thank you very you. much for thank you so much. thanks for coming in. We appreciate it.